Hi everyone, this is Jason Barrick of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a first time guest. Been listening to her interviews lately, they're really, really good. And uh, our listeners have been sending me comments and emails telling me to get her on. She's a former stockbroker at Lehman Brothers and she's the chief market strategist at ITM Trading. Lynette Zhang, thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Jason. This is great. And we have such great sound quality, and I'm excited to speak to you about your expertise in the currency markets. Uh, in your opinion, with the currency volatility we're having, are we having currency wars, or do you think these are coordinated devaluations by global central bankers? Well, I think it's really probably a combination of the two. Um, and, and part of the thing that nobody ever really talks much about is how currencies um, are in relation to each other and the fact that they were pegged and that peg uh, was broken in 2015 by the Swiss Central Bank where their currency was pegged to the euro dollar. And then, uh, so that's a currency war, actually, because what that did was it showed the, the central bankers that they really couldn't trust each other. Because two days before they broke the peg, the Swiss central bank said, oh, no, we're committed to this peg. And then two days later, they shocked everybody when they were no longer committed to that peg. So um, it, I think it's a currency war, but I also think that they're working together for uh, for devaluation on a global basis because we're all headed into – this is a global currency reset. So, yeah, it's kind of a combination of the two. I actually totally agree. I think, I think it's the G7, so your uh, United States Federal Reserve, European Central Bank, Japan, uh, the ECB, European Central Bank, Bank of England – are working basically together versus the developing world and maybe China's working. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's the way it is. And I think, you know, those guys, like you said, are running pegs. So if you're a developing country, you're running either a Euro peg or a dollar peg. The Swiss though are known as the money cockroaches. So they were kind of worried about that. How, <laughs> how, how long did they run their uh, Euro peg for? It was only like four years, right? Yeah, it was a kind of interesting um, story. And I actually learned it when I, travel to Hungary and I would ask people and at the time that we were doing the variable rate mortgages the uh, Swiss franc was a lot cheaper against the euro dollar so a lot of people in Europe were taking out loans based upon the Swiss franc because it was cheaper the payments were cheaper and then the euro dollar and that was um, yeah so that was prior to it but they pegged it in 2011 after the Swiss franc got substantially stronger than the euro dollar and those payments, just like the variable rate payments went up, the payments on the Swiss debt went up dramatically, creating a lot of defaults. So that's when the Swiss central bank stepped in in 2011 and pegged it. And then they broke the peg January 15th of 2015. And during those only four years, I think the Swiss uh, Central Bank accumulated hundreds of billions in uh, reserve assets, and then mm -hmm. they turned into a hedge fund. <laughs> and I, and they own they own like I think they're the largest shareholder of Facebook now, and they have eighty billion dollar technology stock portfolio of U.S. stocks. It's it's ridiculous. Well, it is ridiculous, and they're not the only ones that are doing that very same thing. <laughs> This, this this is dystopian. What we have here with the central banks intervening in markets. Uh, you mentioned you think basically then this is a race to debase, though. Oh, a hundred percent. Yes, I do. Because you know we we the whole monetary system is based on debt, and we hit peak debt, the ability for debt to actually be stimulative, in ninety seven. And so that's when the speculative derivatives were really, really brought in to create more leverage. But they knew the game was over then with long-term capital management and all that. They knew the game was over then. Oh, maybe they didn't completely know. But they learned pretty quickly because no matter how much more debt they took on, you know, I mean, you look at the monetary velocity chart, it just goes down and down and down, even if you get a little blip up here or there. So, Yeah. I think they know that the gig is over and they just want to transfer as much wealth as possible before everybody knows that it's over. Uh, before we talk about velocity of money, you know, there's something I want to ask you more about later in the interview. But there is a lot of really weird things going on right now. Uh, it seems, you know, mm -hmm. we hear this in the alternative media that the uh, – 
a lot of foreign governments want to get out of the U.S. dollar, right? They want to get out of treasuries right. and get out of the U.S. dollar. And maybe uh, over the long term, a lot of com uh, countries have been selling their treasuries. But lately, it seems a lot of foreign governments, China, uh, Saudi Arabia, others <laughs> have been started to increasing their treasury purchases. Do you think they're why do you think they're exactly doing that? Well, uh, I think number one, because it probably uh, we were probably in jeopardy of breaking out an interest which could indeed trigger a derivative default but let us not forget the substitution fund that the IMF has set up to convert whatever dollar denominated instruments they have into SDR denominated instruments so there are a number of ways to get out of dollars but I think it's to try and support the treasury market for just a minute because maybe they're not quite ready yet and, and also uh, buying treasuries with your own currency. If you're create, creating more of your own currency, it devalues your own currency too for favorable exactly. for favorable exchange rates. Because it seems to me, Lynette, that almost everyone's trying to do mercantilism, but then this becomes like a zero-sum game uh, that eventually leads to trade wars. Right. And, you know, there was a day when that actually would have made a difference. But these days, if you're building a car, you might get parts from all different places in the world. So it doesn't really work the way that in theory it once worked where you devalue your currency and now you're exporting a lot because you might only be doing a piece or a part in a number of different countries. So that doesn't really, it doesn't really ring true. Exactly. It's only it's very myopic. It's very short term oriented. Uh, so they're trying to get a short term trade advantage, but everyone's trying right. to do basically the same thing. Ben Bernanke actually wrote a white paper on this. I think it was before he became Federal Reserve chairman. He said that if everyone takes turns devaluing or devalues at once, then mm -hmm. it's not inflationary. <laughs> uh, uh. I don't even know what to say to that. If you want to know the truth, that, that doesn't happen that, very often. That that's uh, that's a good uh, academic theory, right? That just doesn't work in reality. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, while the central bankers come from academia, I mean, we may be seeing something different moving in the future. But yeah, I don't think they really know what it is to live in the real world that you and I live in. Because if everybody devalues the currency, then that means that everything costs more. And that's inflationary. Exactly. And I think that's what we have, too. I think we have stagflation. I think it's going to get worse. But in the currency markets, when you started working in the financial industry, I think, mm -hmm. you know, a one or two percent move in the in a currency exchange rate in a oh. whole year was normal. And now we get that in a day with a dollar day. yen or it's crazy about the amount of currency exchange rate volatility we have going on, though. Yeah, but it's all about financialization. Which, you know, once we once we handed over full power to create inflation to the central banks and they were completely in control, then over time, the financial markets became more and more and more important and mainstream Main Street less and less important. So back in the day when I first became a stockbroker in 86 and then started studying currencies in 87, um, we still hadn't, we were just starting on the globalization piece in there and there weren't all of these products, you know, all the derivatives to move the currency market, the bond market, the real estate. I mean, everything's been turned into a financial product now. Yeah, and there wasn't high-frequency trading algorithms. No. Uh, there, I mean, things were starting to get computerized, but there wasn't, you know, high-frequency trading algorithms where there's no human being monitoring the trading programs. Right, right. And, and you know, there were different ways that the firms were making money. You know, so now they're making money on everything, just trade, because really interest rates at zero bound, well, the traditional way that a bank would make money was on interest, the difference between what they would pay you and what they could borrow it for. Well, that's not good anymore for banks. That's not enough. It's all of the trading and it's all of the volatility. They actually like the volatility, except for the derivatives. That has me a little nervous, a lot nervous. I want to transition now and ask you about velocity of money. Uh, in your other interviews on Greg Hunter, USA Watchdog, mm -hmm. you've shown a chart with the velocity of money collapsing. Uh, for listeners who don't know what velocity of money is, can you explain it, uh, what it sure. is? Sure. Really simply, 
Um, it's the number of times that money changes hands. So if I have confidence in my income, I might be more likely to go out and take on debt or to go out and go shopping. But if I'm not confident in my income, then maybe I'm going to save more. So a, a really good example would be if I had a good week and I've been looking at a car, well, maybe now if I think my income is going to be consistent, I go out and I take on debt to buy that car. And the money changes from my hands to the car dealership's hands. And the guy that sold me the car makes a commission and he says, gee, now I can take my wife away on that weekend. And he's feeling kind of flush. So the money transfers from his hands to the hotel's hands. They go out for dinner. He leaves a big tip and the waitress goes, okay, now I can buy Johnny those sneakers. So it's the number, uh, the monetary velocity is the number of times that money changes changes hands and according to the Federal Reserve and other data it's worse now than it was during the depression in 33 by a very wide margin and that's this is one of the things that uh, one of the signals in the real economy that shows that the real economy is not doing well compared to the asset markets that you know central banks have propped up since the 2008 financial crisis and that Wall Street has put a lot of their um, a lot of their capital into it's that the money has not necessarily gotten into the real economy exactly because you know when people look at their statement i mean look at all the pension plans and the insurance policies and the 401ks and the iras i mean we've been trained to live in the intangible world uh and but we live in the physical world so we it's that nominal confusion piece there but yeah they have to keep those propped up and actually, all of those QE, all that money printing, that's a hyperinflationary pattern. It's just that it's gone into hyperinflating the stock market, the bond market, the real estate market, and the derivative markets. Yeah, I think there's definitely an argument to be made that a lot of the asset markets, whether they're stocks, bonds, real estate, those assets have basically been hyperinflated already by all these uh, central bankers putting uh, either exactly. cheap money or cheap credit in. Uh, the valuations on the stock market, if you removed share buybacks with debt, we'd be well mm -hmm. over 30 times P.E. ratio. Uh, the bond market's been in an artificial bull market for over 35 years. Uh, real estate, some real estate markets in the United States cities, it's like 2006, uh, the 2007 crash, 2007 and eight crash never even happened. Well, there's a lot of uh, zombie commercial real estate loans that are on the books. And look at all the stores that are going out, pushing more commercial real estate on the market. And yet these markets don't seem to go down. Hmm. Interesting. Well, well uh, you know, the, the real people for uh, people on Main Street, for them to go buy assets, they have to work hard and, you know, save the money and go and buy mm -hmm. it. But if you're a hedge fund manager, investment banker, you can just figure out ways to borrow it cheaply then and go and buy assets. And I think that's what's been happening. Well, or they buy derivatives against those assets where it actually is even cheaper and allows them a lot more leverage. And that's really, that's really the danger because once we hit peak, uh, peak debt in 97, well, what do bankers know? They know debt and they know leverage. So once the debt no longer functioned to quote unquote stimulate, then they had to lay on the leverage and convert all financial assets, real estate, you know, the buildings, the payments over here, the buildings over there, uh, stocks, bonds, student loan, I mean, more debt, student loans, auto loans, you know, take your bet, pick. Everything's been turned into a financial instrument and then leveraged. Now, uh, legendary Wall Street floor trader Art Cashin has called Velocity mm -hmm. Money just lending and spending. That's how he summarizes it. In your opinion, what can you, what do you think is going to get Velocity of Money going again in the real economy? Ah, well, uh, he, Art Cashin is right and I like him very much. Uh, and so it is the lending and the spending. And we've seen a significant breakdown in the, in the lending parameters, doing very similar things to prior to the crisis in 2008 with subprime autos and even subprime real estate low down payments, all these things, these, um, and we haven't even gotten to the part of financial deregulation yet. So uh, the ability to borrow is definitely um, 
being boosted. So, yep, and that will get that will also unleash the hyperinflation in Main Street. Or should they go cashless and then start attacking the principal? So you have you know a thousand bucks in your bank account, and the next day you look and it's nine hundred, and the next day you look and it's eight hundred, and it's because of the fees in the negative interest rate environment. What are you likely to do? Spend that money before it's completely eroded away. And I think, you know, like you said, that's kind of what the people in power want. They want to come up with new ways to either get you to take that money out of your bank account and go and chase asset prices or take that money out of your bank account and go and spend it on consumer goods. But, you know, exactly. this goes back to the this goes back to the Keynesian theory of saving uh, the paradox of thrift. And, you know, mm -hmm. if you save the savings lot is bad because then uh, that's bad for the economy. Mm hmm. Well, that's right, because in this in this environment, money's created via debt. You know, but you cannot really build wealth with debt. It just makes it nominally look like more because there's more zeros after it. But um, they still have the the different assets. Well, they don't even have the same fun stocks don't have the same function that they once had. I mean, it, it used to be that a corporation would issue stocks and then they would build a factory and they would hire people, expand their business. And so that was economically stimulated. But if you look at any of the IPO registrations at the SEC, and I can't say any because I haven't looked at every single one, but uh, everyone that I've personally looked at, so and that's quite a few, says that that's about getting to paying out the early investors and having access to the capital markets. That's what that's about. So we think of stocks in one way, but in reality, they've morphed into this whole different product, but yet we're still stuck in that old paradigm, and it's not true anymore. And you said that uh, I, I, uh, I disagree with you on one thing there. You said that wealth okay. building cannot be used with debt. If you're a rental property owner buying for cash flow, you know, or if you're a small business owner and you know that you're going to expand your business and you're going to double your revenue, uh, make more profits, then that's prudently using debt. But there's limits to that with, you know, cash flows. And that's right. Not and I would agree with that. Yeah, you're that's, right. That's not what's going on now. I mean, debt's being used for literally almost anything. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're right. You're talking about self-liquidating debt. You know, so as that's accurate. You borrow money, you expand your business, and that stimulates the economy, and then that taking on that debt pays itself back. But what we have mostly is non-self-liquidating debt where, you know, there there's no way to pay that back, especially with governments, especially with the military, especially with all these entitlement programs. So, so if the if the velocity of money, let's say it doesn't start to come back in the real economy, uh, do you see uh, stagflation getting worse in the real economy then? Well, we're already experiencing it where our cost of living is going up, but our wages are not. They're they're flat. So we're already in stagflation. And and honestly, all of these Asians, whether it's inflation, deflation, or stagflation, is a fiat money phenomenon. It's not really a, a good money phenomenon. I'm not saying that it won't move inside of a range, uh, but it, there is there are limitations one way or the other. So, and the only way to fight deflation or stagflation is with inflation. And the whole point of inflation is to um, be able to tax you more and make it happen invisibly. Push the prices of wages up so you get taxed on higher nominal wages while your real wages, what you can buy with those wages, decline. The stock market, the bond market, it's, it's, to, it's to make things look like they're more than they are any of those Asians are, but the deflation that I think they're really fighting is the, uh, is the tax revenue deflation, because how are you going to service all of these debts if your income to service these debts is not there? So more than anything, there's lots of reasons, but more than anything, I think that's why it's so critical that they generate that inflation. And if uh, asset prices collapsed, uh, government tax revenues on capital gains would also collapse too. Exactly. So, so, so there's big incentives here now, unfortunately, 
for you know what the central bankers like Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke and others have called the wealth effect is you know the government with nominal gains in asset prices not counting real inflation rate the government can keep its tax revenues increasing exactly but actually um, interestingly enough and I just did this this morning so it's fresh in my mind but once we hit 97 and particularly into 2001 when you know the Nasdaq bubble popped and then we had 9/11 their income revenues declined dramatically so you can actually if you look on the um, graph you can really see that pattern shift and they've been really struggling to get that back up there ever since then you know prior to that it was a pretty steady just up 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 through the inflation but once we hit that peak debt level and the ability for debt to stimulate the economy, it's a pattern shift. And it's pretty obvious that that's really the deflation that they're fighting. And I think that's around when Alan Greenspan started talking about the wealth effect, too. So, I mean, <laughs> so they used, uh, you know, one thing to sell it to the public when the reality was something different. Also with stagflation, Lynette, you know, according to Keynesian economics, it's not supposed to be possible. You're not supposed to be able to have <laughs> high inflation and high unemployment at the same time. Right. Well, you know, um, <laughs> Keynesian economics is really uh, in, in evil and genius on, on many levels, especially with that inflation. And as Benny also said, Ben Bernanke in his 2002 piece that he did on how he would fight deflation, you know, a determined government with a printing press can always increase prices. They can always force prices higher and create that inflation. Uh, but that's where, you know, the system is irreparably broken. We have to reset. And, and part of that um, indicator is that stagflation because they can't seem to be getting those wages up. Yeah, I, I see stagflation increasing. I see trillions and trillions of misallocated capital. Uh, the asset, you know, while the real economy, to me, there's a lot of indicators that the real economy in the United States is getting worse. The global economy is not doing well, and yet the asset prices, Lynette, continue <laughs> to go higher. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah. So if you're a Keynesian and you're looking at this, well, why why is the money not going into the real economy then? Why is the money going to asset prices? Uh, if you're not a Keynesian, you see it's pretty obvious that, that, there's, that there's stagflation going on right now. Right. And that's also a wealth transfer mechanism because if you look at what the insiders are doing, and my favorite particular site for that is the um, NASDAQ site. And you just put in whatever stock you want, insiders and NASDAQ, and it'll take you right to it. And it's pretty obvious that the insiders are taking advantage of these markets at this high and transferring their wealth out of the system. And because people look at the stock market going up and go, oh, see, everything should be fine. They're not looking at volume. They're not looking beneath the surface at all. So they leave their wealth in there. And um, there's no liquidity on the other side. So when a lot of people choose to liquidate at the same time, something happens to make them nervous, they're going to find that's where their wealth is going to stay because the real wealth has already been pulled out. What the large corporations have been doing is kind of, you know, a shell game where they do one thing with one hand and something different with the other. Yeah. So they've been using shareholder money and access to capital markets for artificially cheap debt for share buybacks to boost earnings up so they can trigger their stock options packages. But with their own personal shares, they're dumping, they've been dumping like crazy. Exactly. And and actually on that NASDAQ site, you could actually see, um, well, not, not everybody executing the warrants, but certainly the uh, insiders, the uh, board of directors, CEOs, CFOs, all those guys. So it's pretty obvious where they're executing, but then they're also liquidating a whole lot more of the stocks that they've already held. We talk about that every Wednesday on, on our YouTube channel. And and I think, you know, the, the charts are also painted uh, to a certain extent in, in the stock markets too with the high yeah. frequency trading. Oh yeah, I mean volume, the last time I checked it, there was a decline in volume of 75%. And out of that, um, at that time, so these numbers could be a little different now because the volume continues to decline. But um, if I remember correctly, something like 81% of that were high frequency trading, which is not about creating liquidity. It's just about front running. 
Yeah, there's there. The, it's it's actually. Did you see that Gary Gensler, uh, the former head of the CFTC, he used to give speeches how high frequency trading was manipulating markets, <laughs> and then he left the CFTC. And do you know where he ended up? Uh, let's see. Hmm. Not it, really, but Goldman Sachs. <laughs> No, no, he actually got oh. hired by the high frequency trading lobbying firm oh, to lobby in favor on the other side now. <laughs> yeah, well, that sounds about right. Yep. It's lucrative. Oh, excuse me. It's not Gary Gensler, it's Bart Chilton, the wrong CFTC guy. The other guy went to work okay. for Hillary Clinton's campaign finance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, either way. <laughs> well, I want to ask you now about the gold and silver markets because uh, okay. rationally, you know, a lot of people would have thought, you know, with all this uh, monetary inflation, all this credit that, uh, you know, all the problems going on in the global economy, uh, potentially uh, U.S. getting involved in wars, gold and silver prices would be higher. Why do you think uh, gold and silver, the paper prices have not done well? Well, we, we know why. Um, you know, the CME group has a, a central bank uh, incentive program for all their trading, but a rising gold price is an indication of a failing currency. So they cannot have that. Um, However, when you look, and that has definitely impacted a lot of people and stared them away from gold because clearly, as you mentioned, all of the different things going on, you would expect in a normal market there would be a true flight to safety, but they don't want you to go to safety. However, if you look at the ultra rarities index from PCGS, you could see that those coins are start at like hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars, and that's going up. So pretty dramatically. So even though the spot market is going down, and even the lower end numismatic market, um, because that's where the normal person would be, not in the hundreds or millions, but you know, in the couple thousand area. So that also has been going down kind of guided by the spot market, but the ultra rarities where the 1% live, that's going straight up to the moon. So they are actually buying gold. That's very interesting. You know, we ha we definitely have a divergence because we've seen with the U.S. Mint retail sales numbers for gold and silver lately that mm -hmm. uh, the middle class retail investor in the United States sentiment has totally collapsed. It's extremely, extremely bearish. Uh, I, I don't know about you guys over at ITM, but I get emails and comments from people who have listened to my podcast for a long time saying they've sold their gold, sold their silver, sold their mining shares, and now they're going in and chasing Bitcoin and Ethereum and uh, doing initial <laughs> coin offerings, and they're chasing whatever's going up. <laughs> it's working. Perception management is can be very successful. But um, no, we don't really, I'm not saying we never get that, but generally speaking, you know, when a client calls in, we help them understand and make educated choices. So rather than just looking at the part that, that the central bankers want you to see, we go a little below the surface so that you can see the truth. Then you make any choice you want. I mean, that's up to you. But at least you know the truth so you can make an educated choice. Uh, what exactly do you guys do at ITM? Do you sell bullion and numismatics or only numismatics? Oh, no. We're, we're full service. So we can do anything that is appropriate for the client. So what we really do or the approach that we really take is we want to understand what you as an individual are trying to accomplish. And then we can structure a strategy to support what you want, what's going to what's going to get you there. So we use, because we're full service, we can use whatever tool, whether it's bullion or numismatics or semi-numismatic or whatever. We can use gold, silver, whatever we need to, to support your goals. Uh, I'm not well researched or very informed about numismatics. Uh, in fact, like most of my uh, experience from friends who buy a lot of bullion have been horror stories about numismatics was on their mm -hmm. first gold and silver purchase. They got screwed over by a bullion dealer with bait and switch. They lost mm -hmm. thousands of dollars. So what would be some ways to research numismatics and what are some maybe affordable numismatics for people out there who only have a couple thousand dollars to consider uh, acquiring? Well, um, for one, well, for one thing, you can go to PCGS and you can go to Coin Values Online. So there are a number of places where you can take an overall look at what's happening in the shows as well as in the auctions. So uh, you know, I mean, that is closer to wholesale. 
but you've got to be working with somebody that's reputable, you know, and that's pretty easy to check. Look at the Better Business Bureau. How many complaints do they have? Do they resolve complaints, et cetera? So you really want to make sure that you're working with somebody that is reputable and is not going to try and, and rip you off. And so those two pieces will help you do that. But frankly, if you only have a couple thousand bucks to work with, uh, you know, I mean, I could tell you the coins that I like, but I'm not sure that that would actually be appropriate for you if that's all you have to work with. So, you know, again, I, I, I go back um, to it's really all about you. And, and it really does depend. It's like I can promise you that I have tried to, hang a, to hammer in a nail on my wall and hang a picture with the back of my shoe. <laughs> okay. However, it is much easier and more effective if I actually use a real hammer. So a lot of times people will just say, well, this is what I want. Well, that may or may not support your goals. So talking to somebody and, and test them, you know, I mean, you should test who you're talking to. Are they knowledgeable about the current monetary system and what's actually happening in there? And can they explain it at a level that you can understand it? You know, if you don't understand what they're talking about, you should probably find someone else, even if it's somebody else in the same firm, you know, but so you want to be dealing with somebody that you can communicate with, that you feel can understand what you're trying to accomplish. It's not a one size fits all. It's not something that they have in their back. They're, they're being pushed to sell. It is, you know, what are my goals and what's going to support my goals and show me why they support my goals and, and make them prove it. I, I wish more people would, would no matter what, whether they're talking to an insurance agent, a banker, an accountant, or a stockbroker, a financial consultant, ask them to prove to you why they're making this recommendation. What a concept. We were discussing this before we started recording. So uh, this is an interesting topic that you and me, I think, uh, have a lot of uh, agreement on. The, the, <laughs> yeah. current the current financial industry, now a lot of stockbrokers now, I think things have changed a lot in the last couple of decades. I mean, now it's basically just a sales job. So if you're as knowledgeable as you said there a minute ago, if you're as knowledgeable about your craft and the financial markets and stuff, basically a lot of the larger firms are probably going to fire you. They're going to tell you to go run a hedge fund because the compliance department or your uh, manager is going to say, well, you're not moving enough product. You're not bringing enough assets under management in. You're not selling the, the garbage or whatever. That's the highest commission. And, uh, you know, you're uh, you're not going to be around here very long. Well, exactly. But I, I will say, you know, I mean, I went to Shearson back in 86 because at that time they had the best training program at the street and they put a lot of money into me and I'm very appreciative of that. But they did not teach me how to read the technical language of the markets. They taught me how to sell an intangible. And, and I can tell you, you know, having worked in that industry that um, I don't, personally know, and I'm not saying that there aren't some, but I don't personally know any stockbroker that has ever bothered to read a prospectus on what he was selling somebody before he made that sale. So, you know, they don't, and, and up until recently, they didn't even have to do what was legally, they didn't have to do what was in your best interest first, which kills me. I mean, that kills me. You're well, dealing with people's wealth. <laughs> Well, they, they still technically don't as long as that was the firm's position because then the compliance department and the lawyers at the firm will back you. So, um, you know, I, I, I was telling you this before we start recording, and I think a lot of firms are like this, not just the one I worked at, but basically they were like, as long as you do what the, your boss tells you to sell and do what we tell you to do, even if it's garbage and we know the client's going to lose money and it's going to generate high commissions, blah, 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 for the firm, then we have your back. So, um. You know, obviously that's not in the best fiduciary duty, but, you know, that's how a lot of the industry has evolved uh, the last couple of decades when it's all short term, uh, you know, as right. much assets under management as possible, right. maximize all the profits. 
Right. And th- and that assets under management, I mean, that brings up a whole nother topic because assets under management means that all that stuff is held in street name. And in street ma- name, that means that you become the beneficial owner, not the legal registered owner. That's way up at the top. But uh, a seed and company or DTC, but everybody between them and you at the very bottom are also beneficial owners. And what that really means is, and, and how they maximize their profits, is that they get to use your equity for their behalf. So they take it, they borrow against it, and then they can do anything they want with that money. And if they do it through the city of London, which is where most of them are done, then there are no limitations to how many times the the same equity can be used or how many entities can use that same equity. If it's done in America, I think the limitation is 140%, but it's a, it's a little skewed because it can go through multiple hands to get to that 140%. This financial engineering sounds like financial oh. alchemy to me, and yet oh. we have people like Janet Yellen saying that there's <laughs> going to be no more financial crises in our lifetime. <laughs> um, I don't know how she sleeps making that statement, especially in the condition that we're in, though I will say this. You know, you have to understand that the job of the central bankers and the job of the government is to keep everybody calm, keep them calm. So if they actually came out and said what they thought, then that would probably um, take things out of their control. And that's what they want. I mean, if they can engineer a, a planned demolition, then they can possibly probably remain in power after the demolition because you don't really get what happened they always like some distance between it but uh yeah uh, that's just a ridiculous statement in my opinion if it if it is a planned demolition they could even blame everything on capitalism and get more power uh, after the crisis or during the crisis too voila you're absolutely right and uh, Janet Yellen, I could tell you I know why she sleeps well is because she has a big fat salary now and her and her husband together have over three full pensions locked in from their tour in academia and her job at the Federal <laughs> Reserve. Right. So, and those pensions are making, you know, six figures each. And then once she leaves the Federal Reserve, if she's not, you know, the bag holder during before the next crisis, she's going to get a six to seven figure book deal. And then she's going to get the consulting fees with hedge funds and the speaking fees, the large speaking fees that Ben Bernanke is getting now. You know, it's kind of interesting that you bring that up because I know all of that's true. But she also knows because it's all over their website that. They're destroying the value of the dollar, and the dollar is going to be hyperinflating. So I don't know how I could possibly check this because she's a private citizen, but I would bet you anything she's converting as much money as possible into gold and tangibles because uh, apparently other than the U.S., every other central banker is buying a ton of gold. Yeah, I think, you know, in her last financial disclosure, she said she owns a lot of uh, stock uh, stock index funds, bond funds, and real estate. But yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these central bankers, you know, for their own personal accounts were actually buying gold. But exactly. I don't think, you know, they would go on uh, CNBC and say they were buying it. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. They have a job to do. Well, uh, this is this is very dystopian, everything that's going on right now. And uh, I enjoy your analysis of everything. Uh, have you looked at the Chinese silver pandas? Because a friend of m- supposedly every year they change the design. So, you know, unlike American silver eagles, which are like the, have been the same design every year and they just stamp a new year on it, they actually change the logo of the panda on the coin. So these actually become, you know, an affordable, uh, an affordable numismatic every year. And I think after only two or three years, I think the premium, one of my friends has made th- over 30% premiums on that. So that's like kind of an affordable numismatic. Well, you know, for me, it's about function because again, when you talk about making a premium, is he converting that silver back into fiat, right? And this is our training to put value in terms of dollars. But, you know, right now, an ounce of gold in Venezuela brings you 10, 000, 10 million bolivars. But the bolivar has more value as a napkin for an empanada. The, you can pay <laughs> yeah. a mar- mortgage off with it. So, you know, for me, 
I never look at it like that. I really seriously, um, yeah, I mean, I had the full paradigm shift. And, you know, the interesting thing about that is having been in this industry on some level my entire life, it even took and and di- jumping into these rabbit holes all the time, you know, it even took me a while to make a full paradigm shift where where I do not think of, of dollars having value, only what I can convert them into. So I really don't care what happens in terms of dollars, uh, especially in this <laughs> manipulated, managed market. I, I really don't care at all, actually. And to add to your points there about Venezuela, uh, there's there's shortages there on everything. There's long lines for people right. to even buy groceries and the shelves are empty. And uh, uh, Maduro, I think, to pay off his soldiers is giving them toilet paper because there's toilet paper shortages. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so their local currency, uh, people don't trust it anymore. And there's, you know, riots and demonstrations all the time in the streets. Yes. And just taking that one step further, while 90 percent of the population is in abject poverty, I did not say 100 percent. So while they confiscated the monetary gold back in 2011, they did not confiscate the numismatic gold. So my bet is, just like history would prove, that uh, the 10% that are not in abject poverty, that's what they hold. And we've actually had that experience here where, uh, where somebody whose family members lived in Venezuela sent up numismatic coins for uh, liquidation so that they could get the money back to them. So... That also puts in a, in a position somewhere inside of this reset to be able to convert that gold into more assets and come out the other side even wealthier. Wealth transfer. Well, you are a wealth of information, Lynette. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Datagal. <laughs> That's uh, my I nickname. Just, Datagal? Yeah. And uh, you do a weekly uh, podcast now? Uh, actually, we do it uh, two or three times a week. On, on Tuesdays, we do what we call the flaf, Flash in Five-ish, which takes one newspaper headline, one particular topic, and I take you a little bit below the surface. Today's happened to be on inflation and deflation and how gold and silver perform through all of that. Uh, and then on Wednesdays, I do an insider trading quarter to show you what the insiders are doing for themselves. And then on um, Thursdays, we typically, though this can vary a little bit, but we have a Q&A. So uh, on our YouTube channel, if somebody is uh, typed in a question, then we answer that once a week. So we're actually up to like, it's just on, right, it's not on a podcast, it's just on our YouTube channel. So we're, we're kind of up to three. At this point. Very cool. Well, I, I enjoyed speaking to you for the first time on this interview, Lynette, and we'll have to have you back on again in the near future. Well, I would like that, Jason. It's been really a lot of fun. You're also a wealth of information and knowledge. It's a pleasure. Wall Street for Main Street needs your help. YouTube stole $7,200 from Wall Street for Main Street in annualized YouTube AdWords revenues, and they kneecapped our analytics down by more than 80% across the board since September 2016 with their new censorship algorithms to stop the rapid growth of our channel. That was money we could have used to upgrade our website, pay bills, and invest in improving our content and growing our business. Our audience of loyal listeners is all over the globe and so large now that if most or all of our listeners were to commit to donating $1 to $5 each month to our Patreon account, we could easily meet our goal on Patreon. Wall Street for Main Street also accepts one-time donations on our main wallstreetformainstreet.com website, that's W-A-L-L-S-T-F-O-R-M-A-I-N-S-T.com website via PayPal, gold money, or Bitcoin. We also accept donations of physical precious metals that can be mailed to us. Thanks to all listeners who have already made a donation, and thanks in advance to any listeners who make a future uh, donation or contribution to the growth, improvement, and success of Wall Street for Main Street.